My name is Nina Weberworth. Good evening and welcome. I'm a board member of Miami Design Preservation League, also known as MDPL. We are proud to sponsor this evening of readings by authors of the Women Writers Group of South Beach, who recently published a collection of their work entitled Miami Off the Page, which I encourage you to purchase. Just a quick note about MDPL before we begin, because it's hard to believe that even in these challenging times, we still have developers ready to encroach on our historic piece of paradise. So the advocacy work of MDPL is of vital importance. I will end my shameless plug by urging you all to join us and become members. So this was my idea, to highlight a local group of women writers who are near and dear to me and give them a platform. Sounds simple. And it was when it was scheduled for last April, in-person readings at the MDPL Museum while sipping wine. Big sigh. But overcoming obstacles seems to be the mantra of the Women Writers Group of South Beach. So I willingly accepted the daunting task of introducing these accomplished women who bravely toil on their own and then come together to inspire, support, and critique each other's work. Creating this wonderful compilation also required much editing, structuring, as well as executing all the layout and graphic design necessary to make it ready for primetime publishing. A true collaborative and Herculean effort characterized by mutual respect. I have followed the 13 year trajectory of Women Writers Group of South Beach with great admiration. Founded by Carol Hoffman Guzman, PhD and Dina Stewart in 2007, the group has steadily evolved, managing to find homes at local ecumenical, cultural and financial venues. Originally meeting at Arts and St. John Church, then the Miami Beach Jewish Community Center, the wonderful Betsy Hotel, and the Capital One Cafe on Lincoln Road. Now, of course, they are currently on Zoom along with the rest of the world. So we're ready to begin. Each of 12 authors will read from their work for three to five minutes, totaling about an hour. You can write questions or comments by clicking on the icon at the bottom of your screen. After the final presenter, Charlotte Selim, Program and Outreach Coordinator for MDPL, will take over the dialogue. So first up, Terry Track. Terry has lived in Miami Beach since vacationing here in 1976. A former attorney, she writes stories and poetry with a penchant for detail. As her favorite subjects are her family, her work is also tinged with humor. She has a passion for travel and has recently visited Cuba, London, and Tashkent, Uzbekistan. She, lives, she loves animals and can often be seen walking her beetle, Brandy. Terry, take it. Hello. I'm so happy to be here and share my poems with you, and I hope you enjoy them. Can you all hear me? Okay, good. Uh, paradise. Sunshine bays this expansive beach, highlighting a long row of geometric hotels which have stead, stood the test of time. It is a place where tourists become the primary residents. They have packed their worries into stuffed suitcases, hoping that the sun will melt their cares away. Their roasting bodies turn as if on rotisseries atop Walgreens beach towers. They are quite the sight, recovering from a whiskey fueled night. They lie there as the sea makes love to the shore, ebbing, retracting, then spilling its salty foam onto the sand. The smell of cubic coffee permeates the air. Bicyclists speed by to no one knows where. The taste of mangoes sweeten the day. Here and there lie orphaned ones along the way. People are not intimidated by fancy cars blasting their horns. They take their time. They know that eventually we all wind up at the same red light. Hurricanes with Spanish names may threaten this paradise, but they know that living here is worth the price. Young leggy Russian girls sink across trendy nightclub floors their provocative eyes beckon older men, hoping to have not just a good time, but a good life. One's wildest dreams seem to be within reach. 
in the unreality that is Miami Beach. I have another one from my, from my early days in Miami Beach. Here is the runner. His hair is thick and brown with gold tipped curls. A caramel colored tan covers his chiseled body. He runs, hazel eyes focused, not along the flat shoreline, but along the lumpy gray sand, which is no match for his Adonis-like legs. His neck rests, on his neck rests a thick link chain from which hangs a large golden medallion. It claps against his broad hairless chest as he runs, revealing a cross etched into one side and a six-pointed star on the other. He jogs early each morning at about the same time. A handful of beach going groupies regularly gather on Miami Beach's 14th Street Beach to admire him. The runner strides are long and stag like, exhibiting strength, determination, and grace. He runs until he is a dot in the distance. After what seems like a long absence to the spectators, he winds down, finally returning to his starting point. He breathes deeply his muscular chest heaving as he circles the blue and white striped towel he had left behind in the sand. Shaking it off, he places it around his wide neck. He slides his feet into open-toed calf leather sandals and walks to the boardwalk with an air of confidence as his devotees follow them with his eyes, with their eyes. He skips up 10 steep wooden steps to the boardwalk, turns left and continues walking south until he disappears from view. He is gone, at least until tomorrow. A stranger has once more made my day, and he doesn't even know it. Thank you all. Thank you, Terry. Next up is Dr. Joy Zaritsky. She is the mostly retired college professor originally from Bronx, New York. She writes to stay out of trouble, although the piece in this collection may do the opposite. She loves living in Miami Beach, but worries how she is going to cope in the future if she stays, which she wants to. She has had several pieces published in out-of-the-way literary magazines and is working on her second novel. Thank you, Dina. Uh, my piece is called A Welcome to Miami in 2050. Welcome to Miami, the only city in the world where we can guarantee you a unique experience, living not on the water, but in the water. It has been a few years now, and we who live here have gotten used to swimming or rowing as a way of getting around. If you visit or decide to buy a place here, there is no need to worry. You don't have to actually swim or row everywhere, although many of us do because it provides excellent exercise. Cars are no longer of use, but you can buy a boat and get around that way. And if you don't want to be encumbered with a boat and don't swim or wish to, we have Uber water, lift water, water taxis, or even water bikes. The concept of sea rise has been known for quite a while. For the, for the past 30 years, scientists have predicted this possibility over and over again due to global warming. But it is not a problem. Life in Miami is flourishing and more exciting than it ever was. Did we know this change was about to occur? Not at all. Even our most prominent Florida politicians denied it was a problem. After all, we reasoned, they were smart people. They wouldn't dream of deluding or lying to us. And even our president assured us that global warming was fake news propagated by left-wingers. And you know, he was a very intelligent person with a superior IQ. He said so himself. <laughs> As a result, no one in power really cared since the dates predicted had been at least 30 years away. And it all seemed distant. So many people voted for these politicians because putting in pumps and raising roads costs money and who wants to pay more taxes? Now we are experiencing a new life with our city. Miami Beach is virtually underwater. 
but surprisingly, no one wants to leave because we love living here. Adjustments have to be made, people started saying, and so they were. We now live on a used to, used to be island that is a beautiful and unique spot in the sea. Most of us live in floating buildings that are anchored to the bottom of the sea. They are modeled on a whole neighborhood in Amsterdam. These houses are wonderful. Although sometimes you might feel just a tad seasick because they sway in the wind during a storm. Our wardrobes have changed as well. As usual, the clothing industry has adapted. Stores, also floating, are selling a wide array of colorful wetsuits in all sizes and shapes. And although they can be a bit tough to put on, they look smashing. Be sure to bring your swimsuits and buy yourself some fashionable wetsuits, which are available at wetsuitsforall.com. You ask about pets, your cats, your dogs, not to worry. Our seaworthy Miami Beach is pet heaven. Yes, of course they know how to swim, but to make their experience extra special, you can now purchase wetsuits for them. The colors can be co coordinated with yours, something we know you will want and need. Just visit petwetsuits.com. Come and enjoy a new experience, or better yet, come and stay. You will enjoy a wave of a time in our new underwater city. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Joyce. You. Next up is Mandy Urania. She is an author, a massage therapist, and an Air Force wife. Her debut memoir entitled Touchy Feely Squeezy, colon, Muse, Muses of a Masseuse, is the story of her comedic life massaging the troops and bouncing around globally from base to base. She has had ants in her pants since childhood and has visited 59 countries thus far. Currently, she lives with her husband in Miami, where she still writes and rubs. Thank you, Nina. <clears throat> Sitting on the dock of the bay, <clears throat> I start the day alone at the water's edge, just sitting on the dock of the bay, wasting time, as the song goes. It's my quiet time, my hour to reflect, to write, to ponder, and to breathe in the peace of the Miami Beach dawn. I'm aware that on the other side of Biscayne Bay lies the craziness of the city, but here in my inlet, there is serenity. This is my happy place. It hasn't been mine. <clears throat> Hasn't been mine for very long. I adopted it only a few months ago when my husband and I moved here. My sanctuary is a wooden platform over the canal and I arrive while it's still dark. Patiently waiting for daylight, I inhale the salty sea air and observe my surroundings. No one's here to disturb my peace. My fellow Miamians tend not to be early risers. Don't they know that's the best part of the day? I'm mesmerized by the water and its movement. A chameleon with an ever-changing color and mood, clothed in a dark green hue, or sometimes a Caribbean blue. But at times, it is cloaked in a foreboding black. There are days when its appearance is calm and flat like a mill pond, and others when it seems raging, showing its angry teeth in the form of white caps. Today is another beautiful day. And this morning, the daybreak is a palette of color, a work of art. It's still dark when I arrive and the leafy branches of the trees right before sunrise form black shadows on the surface. In contrast, the lampposts lining the bank shed a gold light on the surface, looking like thousands of Christmas lights twinkling. Out of the corner of my eye, pink, purple, and yellow fluffy clouds fill the horizon a prequel to the main event. I take in the colors all around me and at the cusp of night and day, nature has painted her masterpiece, a perfect mirror image of sea and sky. I cut my hands around the mug, my coffee mug, and I'm comforted by the warmth of the sun on my skin. I sit motionless, inspired and full of appreciation. But on this particular day, I also feel joy. Today, I have surprise visitors. 
The canal is a party scene, alive and bustling. Looking up, I see silver-bellied mullets somersaulting joyfully in the air, then splashing back in. Well, good morning to you too, I say. I lie down flat to watch them, my head hanging over the platform to see their little faces. Mullets don't usually smile like dolphins, but I do sense their happiness. They're oblivious to me in their own world underwater, and they swim to the other side out of sight. Their playground becomes a sea of glass once more. And there it is, my own reflection. Is that really me? There's an unfamiliar softness, a sense of calm that wasn't there before. The gods of the sea have washed away my worries and my sorrows and brought me a new peace and tranquility, brought me back to nature. I take in a deep breath, a breath of gratitude, and I know that this is where I'm meant to be. I am home. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you. Next up is Pam Mayer. Pam arrived kicking and screaming at Jackson Memorial Hospital, where she took her first Miami breath. Though she has tried to relocate over the decades, she always returns to her Miami Beach home. Her love of all things creative, from theater to art, and her passion for writing have led her creative to creative storytelling. No one and nothing is safe from her looking at the humorous side of life and taking a pen to paper. Take it away, Pam. Wim Week. I stare at the message board. I read it out loud in a whisper. Swim Week. Modeling. Call seeking four foot three inch to five foot nine inch models, ages 13 and up. My voice rises. You've got to be shitting me. Excuse me, Ma. I'm four feet 10. I'm 13 and up. I'm what you're looking for. I start moving through the crowd. Wait for me. Tell me what to do as they disappear into a sea of bodies. Breathe, breathe, I tell myself as I get poked by a boob in the eye and hit by a thong clad model's butt as she strides by me. Everyone is in a hurry here. I step up to the counter and I stand on my tiptoes, clear my throat. <clears throat> I catch the eye of the girl fumbling with papers. This is the place for me to sign up? She looks over and glares down at me. Mm, for what? I point to the sign. Oh, model? She winces. Yes, model, swimwear, bodies, cute to sexy. I read from the application, I'm your woman. I stand tall, I stick out my tits and I pull my core in and rise to my full stature. Now I've got her attention. She looks at me. She knows I mean business. She finally gets me. Sign here as she hands me the form. It's full of legalese along with the right to use photos for press releases and marketing. No problem, I sign, hand her the paper. By the way, I share, I have no issue with my photos. Use them wherever, whenever. She smiles, here's your number, put it on, line up with the others over there. I feel her eyes following me and I glance back. I think she has some sort of a tick because she's shaking her head from side to side, shudders and then goes back to work. Wish me luck, I say to no one in particular. Hi, girls, guess I'm last in line. Save the best for last and all that. The girl standing in front of me just rolls her eyes. I'm not prepared for my unexpected audition. I need to gather my confidence. I know just like my fave Tina Turner song. I start humming and begin to sing. You're simply the best, mm -hmm. better than all the rest, mm -mm -mm -mm. better than anyone, mm -mm -mm -mm. anyone I ever met. That feels good, real good. The other girls near me start to giggle and then they join in. I'm stuck on your heart. I hang on every word you say. We all do a group hug. I just love this model camaraderie. You a first timer, she asks. How do you know, I ask. Lucky guess, she says. What happens when I get to the head of the line? What do I do? I venture, simple, she offers. They ask you to walk, stop, pose, turn and walk back. That's it, I sigh with relief. I'm a natural. I've been walking, stopping, posing and turning for decades. This will be a piece of cake. 
cake. Damn it, I wish I hadn't eaten that chocolate salty caramel donut yesterday. Low carbs, more protein, no donuts. I repeat over and over as a mantra. Next, 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 a voice booms out as each girl takes her time, making the most of their audition minute. Suddenly next is me. Me? 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 My brain is freaking out. Imagine me taking the runway by storm. Next, loud and clear sounds the voice behind the microphone. Before I begin, I take a deep breath and I pray, please, Lord, pick me, please, please, please. Come on, number 313, let's get going. It's been a long day. The mic reverberates. I start to walk the red carpet. I pose, hold it, turn, make my way back. Time moves in slow motion. The distance feels like a 5K. The microphone voice orders 313, join the girls in the group on the right. Is right good? Is right right? Do I have that special sparkle they're looking for? The panel seems to be in a huddle conferring on who will be in and who will be out. The microphone clears his throat. <clears throat> girls to the right. Please step forward and get your assignments. Oh my God, I shriek, jumping and cheering like I've scored the winning touchdown in the Super Bowl. Or I tied Mother Teresa for sainthood. The others on my team act as if this is just another day at the office. A woman in designer chic, chic clothes approaches me. Her oversized glasses take over her face as she softly utters, here we go. And she hands me a swimsuit and a cover up. You're going to bring up the rear. The rear? The rear of the swimsuit like a thong? I question picturing a painful wedgie. The last to walk the runway, the end model, the finisher, she explains. Holy crap, I'm gonna be the finisher. I'm going to bring it home, wrap up the show, take the final bow and hear the thunderous applause. That's it. You have to buy the book. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Pam. Next up is Dina Stewart. She is a native New Yorker who was a teacher, editor, and corporate executive before becoming a painter. Enticed by the Lincoln Road art scene, Dina and her husband, Stewart, relocated to Miami Beach. Together, they founded Center for Folk and Community Art to address social issues using writing and illustrating. Dina and Stewart produce a Live on South Beach, an online video show. Dina wrote Inner Peace, It Isn't Out There, available on Amazon. Thank you, Nina. The weekend was in January of 18, of, I'm sorry. The weekend was in January of 1989 two years after Stewart and I left New York to restart our lives as Lincoln Road Art Center artists. The area was still sullied by reported drug deals and crime waves hyped by the popular television show Miami Vice. It remained run down and sparse of foot traffic. There were no art buyers. You know, the Super Bowl was being played in Miami this year. Let's throw a big party during Super Bowl weekend. We'll call it the Super Bowl Ball. If the NFL agrees to include our event in their list of activities, we'll get major publicity, Stewart suggested to our innovative group of activists. All agreed, and a formal request letter was submitted. But the NFL Super Bowl committee turned us down. Forget about them. If they won't include our event in their official program, We'll call it the unofficial Super Bowl ball and create our own NFL or no fooling league, we decided. Now, all we needed was our own NFL commissioner. We got super lucky. A longtime friend of ours was the showbiz attorney. A few calls to people he knew along with some heavy negotiating and we had our NFL commissioner signed up. Our celebrity and his entourage arrived in town early Friday morning, the day before the event. They owned a station wagon at the time, so Stewart offered to chauffeur them from the airport. I went along for the ride. Hi, I'm Mike, the manager. An 80-year-old cherubic-faced man in a seersucker suit greeted us. 
He introduced us to the backup performers, Peter Pesto, a New Jersey lounge lizard with a shiny pompadour, and Virgin McKay, an exotic dancer with a baby face and voice to match. Standing in the background was the instantly recognizable figure in a three-piece suit of light blue polyester fabric covered with musical notes. He carried a matching shopping bag. Hi, I'm Tiny Tim, the hulking man with the prominent beak nose, big yellow teeth, and shoulder length, shoe polish brown, stringy curls said, extending his hand to shake. His voice was soft and deep with no hint of the high pitched falsetto he was known for. When we reached their hotel, we gave them a brief rundown of the activities we had scheduled. Relax, unwind, we'll pick you up at 3.30 for the swearing in ceremony at City Hall. Bulbs flashed and the chatter buzzed as we made our grand entrance. The commission chamber was filled with city workers, reporters and photographers. With the six elected Miami Beach commissioners standing in a row behind him, Mayor Alex Dowd ceremoniously swore in Tiny Tim as commissioner of the NFL, no fooling league. When the oath was said and done, Tiny Tim whipped out his ukulele from his shopping bag, strummed the opening chords and everyone in the room, including our city officials, joined him in his signature song, Tiptoe Through the Tulips. As Peter Pesto and Virgin McKay stood to his side and rhythmically swiveled their hips, I thought, can't get any more surreal than this, but it did. Thank you. <laughs> Next up is Marge O'Neill Butler. She is a resident of Miami Beach, Florida and is the regional rep for the Dramatist Guild of Florida region. She is also a member of the New Play Exchange Honor Roll and the International Center for Women Playwrights. Her work is seen in 29 states, the District of Columbia, Canada, Great Britain, Scotland, and Seoul, South Korea. She has had 26 plays produced in multiple theaters, numerous readings, and just about as many rejections. Take it, Marge. Thank you. Mr. Bean goes to Miami Beach. He was named Mr. Bean by his rescuer. I first saw him on a friend's Facebook page looking for a forever home, a dopey little face staring at the camera, unknown breed, fluffy all over. Since we already had two big rescue dogs, Bella and Busta, I scrolled on. Then he appeared on Facebook again and again. How is it that nobody wanted him? Finally, I said to my husband, Mr. Bean needs us. My husband, not being fond of small dogs, was loath to agree to adopt him. He did, however, agree to meet him. When Mr. Bean came to our house with his foster mom, he was very excited, sniffing everywhere. He attempted to pee at every turn. He tried making friends with our big dogs, Bella and Buster, but they were not too pleased. Then we heard his backstory. He was found wandering the streets of Homestead, Florida. Someone had cut off his tail. When they first found him, he couldn't sit down without yelping in pain. He was all matted and scabby and had a piece of wire hanging out of his mouth. Our neighbor, Susan from the beach, rescued him and had him in the vet's office for six weeks. We adopted him. Mr. Bean is a combination of several small breeds. Anyone's guess would be as good as mine. He's all fur and bulging eyes. When we groom him, we only have his head clipped. I wanted him trimmed up so he didn't look so scruffy, but my husband said Mr. Bean wouldn't like it. Since when do dogs have opinions? So we leave him all fluffy and messy. That's day one. By the next day, he's a mess, fur-headed in every direction. Every two weeks, he goes berserk. When the lawn men come, we lock the dogs in while the garden is shaped up. Bean 
runs from room to room the entire time, yelling at the two men. I'm convinced his tail was removed by a weed whacker. Thank you. Next up is Alexis Delgado. She was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. In 2006, after a professional background in public relations in the field of travel and tourism, Alexis retired to Miami Beach. Writing has been one of her lifelong passions. She hopes to publish a book of essays about her life experiences. Another goal is to open up a dog rescue center. Alexis enjoys boating on the intracoastal waterways in Miami and captains her own boat. Take it away, Alexis. Thank you, Nina, so much. Miami with Brandon. It's over. He's gone, Dr. Mitchell whispered. I could not grasp he was really gone. Motionless, I looked down at his lifeless frame. I can still feel the warmth of his body on my lap. He looked peaceful on his tummy, his head resting on his front paws in the same position as when I first set eyes on him at the American Kennel Association some 13 years before. There was no indication of suffering other than the old tear stains around his eyes. The harsh hollow cough that tormented us both had disappeared. I met Brandon in New York on July 8, 2002 and fell in love with him and fell in love with him the moment I saw him. His head rested on his front paws and never moved, but his eyes followed my every step. The salesperson said he was a pure breed Shih Tzu, but I think he was a Shih Tzu Havanese mix. He was three months old, gray and white, and sort of scruffy looking. No one had given him a home yet, but from the very first moment I saw him, it was clear he was coming home with me. The salesperson showed surprise when I chose him over all the teacup cuties and quickly offered to bathe and groom him. I would have taken him with or without a bath. I don't recall the salesman at all, only his blank look. I suppose he really didn't understand that it was Brandon who had actually chosen me. My husband wanted to name him Brandon, Brandon because he had this half mask like strap, stripe across his face. But I insisted I wanted to give him a person's name because he had these intense human-like expressive eyes that touched my soul. He deserved a person's name, I thought, not a pet, no character name. So he became Brandon. Brandon quickly became my treasured companion, adorable and affectionate, with big, warm, loving eyes. His silky, smooth hair fell around his face in a way that created bangs, and at times he looked like he was wearing a helmet. He always trolled behind me and had a little wag when he walked, reminding me of a wind-up toy. He occasionally played tug-of-war with me, but never really cared to perform any tricks or play with other dogs. He was perfectly happy just tagging along everywhere with me. Moving to Miami had been a, change, a life changing decision. I left my career, my home, and my family behind a lot earlier than I had imagined. And that was not easy. I had recently been diagnosed with MS and I knew that moving to the beach was a smart move. The warmth and the sea air would be more forgiving with my new health challenges. I wasn't totally unfamiliar with Miami Beach, having worked in public relations for a travel and tourism firm in New York for 25 years. Ocean Drive had been one of my accounts. With Brandon in tow, I was able to mask my physical limitations. I used a stroller for stability on long walks, and amazingly, when I used my cane, he knew exactly how much pressure to use on my left side to help me maintain my balance. He knew when to slow down and when to go. Together, we experienced the freedom to move around the, this beautiful, magical city, which was pet-friendly and welcoming. Our morning routine strolls on the beach through Pine Tree Park or sometimes all the way to South Point were glorious, meditative and rehabilitating. Brandon's uniqueness and companionship helped me rediscover and regain my independence. In an extraordinary way, he became my service dog, my life coach. His indescribable source of energy and presence gave me confidence. We did everything together. We even bought a boat. I had always dreamed of owning a boat and listening to the sounds of boats and watching them zipping to their destinations during the Miami boat show from my terrace motivated me even further. I envisioned buying something medium, medium sized and low maintenance with a cabin cuddy where Brandon can comfortably sleep and seek shelter from the sun on those scorching hot summer days. I had this image of traveling up and down the beautiful intercoastal waters with friends and family around government cut and onto the beach side 
where we can anchor by hold of a sandbar, swim, float, drink, and just be free. He can sit on the helm enjoying the breeze as I had witnessed other boaters do with their dogs. So in 2011, as impulsive and insane as this may sound in one of the boat shows at the Miami Beach Convention Center, I packed Brandon in his stroller and we went boat shopping. I suppose buying a boat with your dog and focusing primarily on his comfort is not ideal. My low maintenance boating dream was anything but. Every time we went out boating, we had to be towed back. The minute Brandon realized we were walking towards the dock, Brandon would run the other way. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis. Next up is Pat Kaneda. She has juggled lives in Japan, Chicago, Connecticut, and Miami Beach since her retirement as a special education teacher. From 1991, she taught English at Conan University and lectured on learning disabilities in Japan. Pat has published several short stories and one work of historical fiction, A Tale of Two Migrations, a French-Canadian odyssey. Her passions are books, writing, drama, film, and travel. She continues to be amazed by all that South Beach has to offer. Take it away, Pat. Thank you so much, Nina. A stop on the timeline. <clears throat> when Steve told Greg that Sharon would be coming down on alternate weekends, Greg, always the risk taker, went back to squatting. He found a building with minimum security near Joe's Stone Crab, broke the rusty lock and moved in. With a sleeping bag and a Coleman cook stove, he managed well. And yes, there were lots of porter potties scattered about for the construction crews. One was conveniently located near his squat. He even brought his three sons down, all teenagers, for a winter holiday. It soon turned into a working holiday for those three towheads were in great demand as models. In New York, Sharon quit her teaching job after they bought a one bedroom on Meridian for 35,000. It had a view to the West and the sunsets were terrific. Sharon didn't have to work. She took tennis lessons at Flamingo Park, swam and jogged. She even got a few modeling jobs with her blonde good looks, but soon all that freedom got old. Just in time, her tennis instructor told her about a group of guys who were hiring painters. Here's their card. They hire by the day. It's just straight painting of walls and they pay a hundred bucks a day in cash. I've done it for a few weeks. Sharon started the following week. Steve packed her lunch for her first day. I hate to see you leave. You look so hot in your white coveralls. He adjusted the red bandana that she tied around her hair and patted her on the bottom. She liked the crew from the very beginning. Jeff, the boss, was her favorite. She didn't mind the work at all. Someone usually brought a boom box and they sang along to their favorite songs, throwing in a few dance steps as they moved from room to room, painting the walls. They were young, handsome, and gay, all educated and from New England, except for Carlos, who'd made it to Miami Beach on a raft from Cuba after a stay in prison allegedly for having a few issues of Reader's Digest in his possession, but more likely for being homosexual. She soon realized that he and Jeff were a couple. There was a lot of action on Ocean Drive. The Art Deco buildings that had been retirement homes were being rehabbed one after another. The residents, mostly elderly Russians, sitting in rocking chairs on the porches looked on in bewilderment and probably wondered if their building would be next. The news cafe was flourishing. Suddenly it was a place to see and to be seen. Madonna, Cher, Gloria Estevan and Enrique Iglesias were among others who could be found talking on their cell phones as they enjoyed brunch. The hotels were being remodeled and deco painters were there. Two years flew by 
and the group felt like family. Hidden beneath the surface, tons of cocaine reached Miami, which meant millions of dollars in circulation, guns, gangsters, and crime. But the stars continued to come and TV shows like Miami Vice brought the tourists. The numbers of restaurants, bars, and clubs increased, many funded by the endless washing of drug money. Who could have foreseen the perfect storm that was to come? Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Irina Patterson. She was born and raised in Russia, where she got her MD degree. She credits her late American husband, a psychologist and writer, with rescuing her from Soviet Russia in 1992 and instigating her love for himself and creative expression. When not writing or reading, she hangs out with tech entrepreneurs, ballroom dancers, artists and clowns who all inspire her to do more writing. Thank you, Nina, very much. I can't believe I'm doing this, for God's sake. I'm 59 and have been a widow for eight years. I went from missing my husband to slowly pulling myself together. And then when I just reach a point when I have regained my sanity, now this, 6 a.m., still dark. I'm in my shower, cold water is running over me. What good can come out of Tinder? I ask myself and reason back. It's just a walk. I walk every day and thought I could find someone to join me. Well, really, not someone, let's be honest, not someone, an interesting guy to join you. I didn't have to wait long. It's a match, my phone flashed shortly after I sign up. I like that Andy, my match, never said that I was hero. Let's have a talk. An exposition and an explorer made this art make sense. I was an exposition. He was an ex lawyer. I smiled and texted back. Could we make it a walk? Cool, he said. Dina Marina Key along the harbor, meet by avocados at the fresh market. Yes, I said, 7 a.m. By nine, I had to be at the Coral Gables Hospital for my cholesterol checkup. As I approached Fresh Market, my heart was pounding. Keep your expectations low, I said to myself. He was at the entrance. It was hard to miss him. Tall, not particularly fit, just tall. He had a big teddy bear look. If they would make a six feet two teddy bears, I like that. It felt safe. Let's get a coffee, he said. We went inside. The store was empty. Normal people were still sleeping. We'll get one for you, I said. I can't. I have a medical test after this. I can't eat. We poured his coffee at the coffee table. Oh, a test, he looked at me. Colonoscopy? I giggled. No, cholesterol. This walk would lower my cholesterol. He said, I like being used. We exited, strolled by the bay. The sun was still low. I inhaled cool morning air and suddenly I felt happy as if someone gave me a cookie, a delicious cookie. I was eating it slowly, savoring every bit. Thank That's you. It. Next up is Irene Sperber. Irene comes equipped with a background in visual arts. She has exhibited photography, art to wear, mixed media pieces, and pen and ink drawings for decades before segueing to art reviews, travel memoirs, and observations. A Miami Beach resident for over 20 years, she studied Asian art practices while living in Hong Kong, spent 
spending a few years experiencing London before heading back home in the early 1990s. Travel off the beaten path is an ongoing passion. Take it away, Irene. Hey, thanks, Nina. I'm going to read an excerpt from my piece, Keys to Miami, and I named it Keys to Miami because I've lived here on two separate occasions and uh, in different apartments, so do the math. <laughs> a happy Miami apartment life began to take an ominous turn by mid-1995 when my husband had a heart attack while staying at the small Manhattan apartment that we'd owned for years on the Upper West Side. My ex called me in New York from Miami the day Richard got out of surgery with the flip phrase, your apartment's building is on fire. I told him through pursed lips, I was a little stressed right now, but he casually added, well, it is, I can see it from here. I had to call a hospital immediately to have them remove Richard's TV since the Miami fire and one death from jumping was all over the network news. I did not think he needed to know that the business he had been busily setting up for the last few months was possibly in cinders along with everything else we owned. Without going into a long sidebar, everything came right in the end, but not before a lot of added angst went down. One aortic valve replacement and a triple bypass, but Richard back on track eventually. Rehabilitation resumed in Miami as soon as he was able to travel home from Manhattan. A few months later, Richard was well enough to take a drive with me in Naples, Florida for a two day respite, returning only to discover Spider-Man had let himself into our top floor apartment via a sliding glass door, relieving us of a fur coat, my collection of personally designed jewelry made from stones selected while living in Asia, a passport, a large piece of luggage, and my husband's bicycle. My mom died a few months later from a sudden series of strokes accessorized with a laundry list of other ailments. My bicycle was soon stolen from outside Crunch Gym and two friends died in the following few months. Spencer had gotten a great gig in New York right after graduation from USC as a road warrior for an innovative morning TV show. He interviewed and participated in people's odd activities in real time. It was mostly enjoyable, except those daring do mornings like when I laid in my sun dappled Miami Beach bed as Spencer got lost on screen live by the cameraman while ice diving in murky chilly waters. As they went to commercial, I was forced to send the program of facts, informing them to tell Spencer I could secure him a nice, safe job in Miami at McDonald's. They read it to him on air after he was retrieved from the icy depths, completely unharmed and unruffled. The program was reconfigured a few years in and Spencer moved back out to LA to map out his next act. It was his first time struggling with things not falling into a preordained place. M had AIDS by now and made the decision to go out in a blaze of wild abandon. Unfortunately, his karma did not allow for this master plan and he slowly, slowly began to fade. I figured this was a slippery patch and we had gone through our allotment of bad things and about to sail into calmer waters but the storm had not even begun. Thank you, Irene. Thank you. Next up is Eva Mosco, also known as Erica Edelman. She always loved fairy tales. She waited for her knight in shining armor to ride in on a white horse and carry her off to the world of happily ever after. She also believed in the tooth fairy. But disappointed by both the handsome knight and the tooth fairy, she began to weave her own tales of hope and love. Her stories, true or not, always end up on a happy note. Take it away. Thank you. The title is The Lie. I lied to my mother. I did that quite often and never thought much about it, but this one was a whopper. My mother, Rose, was a petite woman with a thickening waist 
and graying hair that she dyed in a natural shade of red. She wore it in short, time, tightly permed curls, a shade of coppery red, which made her head look like a red matzo ball. Her smooth com complexion belied her age of 52. The only makeup she used was orange lipstick. We lived in a small Eastern Pennsylvania town, but Rose was European to the core and hung on to her old world sensibilities relentlessly. She was determined to mold her daughter, me, into a shining example of what she thought of as a lady. She should be quiet, courteous, respectful, and above all, obedient. Delivered with a heavy Hungarian accent, the lectures were frequent and tedious. I wanted to be a typical American teenager and ignored them all. Headstrong and rebellious, I was a real handful. I was 18 and in love. My boyfriend, David, had soft brown eyes, curly hair, full lips, and an easy smile. He was smart and his wicked sense of humor made me laugh. Being with him was easy and natural. We spent every possible minute together doing everything and nothing. Now back to the big lie. David was going to the University of Miami and asked me to visit him during spring break. I had never been to Florida and I wasn't about to pass up this trip and the opportunity to see him. I knew my mother wouldn't let me go. So I had to come up with a plausible story. I invented a girlfriend who was going to visit her cousin in Miami and invited me along. Fortunately, that passed the smell test and I was on my way to Miami. Thank you. Thank you. And last up is Miriam Steinberg. She is a writer and graphic designer born and bred in Queens, New York. Currently, she is an MFA candidate in creative writing and literature at Stony Brook University in Southampton and happily divides her time between New York and Miami Beach. Her work has appeared in the Southampton Review. Take it away, thank Miriam. You, Nina. Okay, thank you, Nina. Um, I'm gonna read an edited version of my essay, Resurrecting the Dead in Wynwood. In Wynwood, the walls explode with a smorgasbord of visual stimulation. I read somewhere about the Bakehouse Art Complex and historic Art Deco building, combining many artist studios, plus gallery space, workshops, and a concert venue. This was how I met Amalia Brujis of Studio 10, a petite middle-aged brunette from Lima, Peru, who welcomed me in with a ready smile. Her paintings have an ephemeral haunting quality that attracted me. Amalia believes that the urban street scenes she paints are populated not only with the footprints of the people presently walking there, but the memory of all who walked previously and the imprints of all who will walk there in the future. I moved about the space, looking through her work. And then she said, I have more paintings, smaller ones, but these I don't show to everyone because they're very special to me. I wanted to be among those chosen to see the special paintings. From the corner of the studio, she pulled eight by 10 canvases from a bookshelf. They were of various scenes, some small families, mother, father, two or three children, some single portraits, some larger groups. There were picnics and forests, formal poses in living rooms, children dressed in school uniforms. It was clear from the dated clothing and other visual cues that they were of a distant time and place. She said the paintings were made from old photographs. I felt a shiver of recognition. Was it the clothing or the furnishings? Something in those canvases did not read as South American, but as Eastern European. 
is this pre-World War II Europe? Are you Jewish? She is. Her parents had met in Peru, having both emigrated in the early 1930s from what is now Ukraine. Her uncle and his family remained behind and were massacred by the Nazis. Who are the others in the picture? I don't know, she said. If I don't recognize them, it means they perished in the war. There is no one left to tell their stories, so I must make up the story through my painting. One day, I opened my mother's old photo albums and something moved me. I started to do pictures. Sitting in my apartment in Miami, I brought my murdered relatives back to life. How poignant and meaningful this work of Amalia's is, now that 75 years have passed and almost all of the firsthand witnesses and survivors are gone. So I asked Amalia to paint my family's photograph, the one my mother had given me so many years ago. It's the front of a postcard sent to my grandmother, postmarked 1922. A family is posed before a rough wooden clapboard house with a dirt yard. The father has a bushy gray beard. Long ear locks dangle beneath his, square, his black square cap and he wears a black coat to his ankles. The mother seems slightly shrunken in on herself as if bound from years of hard work. She wears calf length skirts, her wig slightly askew. There are two daughters, one tall and one short. They wear high boots, plain dresses with aprons tied in front, and they flank a, fa a, a frail looking brother in a rumpled suit and hat. His ears poke out a bit. Who were these mysterious people? Mom explained that this was the family my grandmother had left behind in Europe. Her parents, sisters and brother, they did not survive Hitler's final solution. Amalia has brought them back to life for me. The faded photograph now hangs as a living work of art. The colors are vibrant. The backdrop is now a blue sky breaking through the branches of the trees. Each time I pass the painting, I reconnect to my mother and my grandmother. They are watching me through my great grandmother's eyes. Thank you so, thank you so much, Miriam. And thank you to all the wonderful readers and writers. Oh my goodness, this was a glorious and enlightening experience. Uh, apparently we have no questions. So, and we did this in the exact hour that we said we would. So I'm proud of everybody and say thank you to you all. And this was truly a wonderful experience. Good night. Nina, Nina thank you very much and MDPL. Thank you. Thank you. This was wonderful. It really was. It was so enjoyable. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Nice to see everyone. Good night. 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 Good